Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbong. Today's book is essentially about propaganda and how the stories we tell ourselves shape policy and affect us on the day-to-day. The book is called The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. It's co-written by Eric Conway and Naomi Oreskes. You you might be familiar with their 2010 book, Merchants of Doubt, which was about the machine of climate change denial. Oreskes spoke with here and now Scott Tong about this new book. And what I find interesting about this interview, you know, besides shady backdoor politics in favor of business interests, is that it's kind of an argument that stories matter, that books and movies can push an entire country to move together towards a goal for generations. Granted, in this case, that goal was to deregulate industry to disastrous effects. Support for NPR and the following message come from Progresso, inviting you to take a moment and reclaim lunchtime. Get ready to recharge with Progresso's new protein Mediterranean-style lentil soup with high-quality ingredients to help you tackle whatever the afternoon brings. Savor each bite with hearty lentils and chickpeas, roasted red bell pepper, and a zesty squeeze of lemon. For more delicious ways to reclaim lunchtime, visit Progresso.com. Support for NPR and the following message come from Edward Jones. You could go alone, but when you have a partner, you could go farther. And when you want to navigate through all the complexities of retirement strategies, it can help to sync up with an Edward Jones financial advisor. They can help you figure it all out with an approach that puts your goals first, not their products. And best of all, they're right around the corner. Let's figure it out together. Edward Jones. Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway know a provocative subject. Their best-selling book from 2010, Merchants of Doubt, explored how physicists laid the groundwork for climate change denial, how they argued against government regulation and in favor of the free market. Well, the idea of a pure, unadulterated free market, the idea and how it came to be, is the story of their latest book. It's called The Big Myth. Your book, I gather, acknowledges a useful nature of market forces to set prices, to reward work. Is the myth something you call market fundamentalism? Exactly. So the book is not a scree against markets. Markets are tools, and like all tools, they're very good for some things and not so good for others. What we're trying to show in the book is how an ideal of the free market in the singular was put forward by business interests in the United States as a way to fight back against regulation of the workplace, to fight back against people who were trying to limit child labor, and to persuade the American people that government regulation of the marketplace was not in our interest. Well, this is a long history lesson where you and Eric Conway follow the money, as it were. We do. Yeah, and early on, one of the key proponents of this message is the National Association of Manufacturers. What was the NAM agenda, as you write? Trade groups were a major place where this argument was developed. So the National Association of Manufacturers was America's largest trade organization in the 1930s and 40s, and they were a major player in this movement to try to create an ideology promoting free markets, pro-market, anti-government. They were involved in trying to block almost all aspects of the New Deal, And even today, they're still involved in trying to block meaningful climate action. Well, and is one of the key arguments made by these industry groups that economic freedom goes hand in hand with individual freedom? Exactly. So what they tried to argue, that if you allow the government to regulate factories, workplaces, other things, that by compromising the economic freedom of business people, you would be on a slippery slope to compromising all freedoms. Well, in this history telling, there are a lot of dots you connect. I want to bring up a couple dots from popular culture. One of them is the Little House on the Prairie books, which many of us know became a massively watched TV series. Shout out to us children of the 1970s. Here is one scene. We were going to have lunch together. I made sandwiches. Oh, dagnabbit. Listen, uh, I'd love to, darling, but... Uh... You gotta keep working. Here, here now. None of them long faces now. Look, the sooner I get done working, the sooner we can head off to Walnut Grove. Help us understand, is there something about these books or the TV show based on the books where this framing of the free market is embedded? 
Yes. So one thing we show in the book is how incredibly extensive these propaganda campaigns were. And one of the most, I would say, sad and heartbreaking parts of the story is the truth about the Little House on the Prairie series. So like millions of girls, I grew up reading those books, loving those books, which were marketed by the publishers, the true life story of Laura Ingalls Wilder growing up as a young girl on the American frontier. And the stories are didactic stories about how the family survived and thrived through dint of hard effort, labor, work, family, love in a nuclear family, and with little or no help from the government. In fact, in the stories, the government just gets in the way. But what scholars have shown that actually these stories were not the true life stories of Laura Ingalls Wilder. In fact, Laura didn't even write these stories. Really? She, she didn't write she them? Didn't, no. Oh she would put goodness. down notes for episodes that happened in her life, but they were crafted into what were essentially libertarian parables by her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, who mm. was a leading libertarian thinker and a close friend of Herbert Hoover. Rose Wilder Lane was part of a network of libertarians that included not just the ex-president, but also the president of Sun Oil Company, J. Howard Pugh, and a whole network of powerful and influential business leaders who encouraged her to use these stories to put forward libertarian ideology. You also write about a very popular program in the 50s called the General Electric Theater. Let's hear a little bit of the opening of that show. In research, in engineering, in manufacturing skill, at General Electric, progress is our most important product. And the host of that show was one Ronald Reagan. You argue that some of this messaging, this propaganda was built into this show. Yeah, so General Electric Theater is a really important part of this story because it links the business interests, popular culture, and American politics. Each week, the program would show a story, and it was a very well-made television program, but almost all of them tell didactic stories of individual enterprise and people succeeding with no help from the government. And this is the whole theme that GE then pushes forward, the idea that just leave things to the private sector, leave things to free enterprise, we'll have great success in our lives, and of course, great success in industry as GE creates better light bulbs and, and electricity. Mm -hmm. But the story is complicated on multiple levels. First of all, while GE is promoting a story of free enterprise, they're actually conspiring to rig electricity markets. And a few later, years later, they would be prosecuted by the federal government. The other important piece of this story is about Reagan himself. When Ronald Reagan first went to work for General Electric, he was a pro-union New Deal Democrat. By the time he comes out, he's an anti-union, anti-government Republican. And that transition happens under the guidance of GE executives who send him out on the speaking circuit. He goes to GE communities. He gives talks at Rotary Clubs promoting the GE ideology. And at the end of this period, he comes out of it not just with a new political ideology, but with a set of powerful and wealthy corporate backers who then finance his campaign to run for governor of California. Yeah, governor, and then, of course, he becomes and then later the president, president of in, in, in right. 1981. And in the Reagan era, the 1980s, is when this power of the market is such a defining one in our conversation and in our culture. So many of us remember the 1987 film Wall Street, starring Michael Douglas, who made this famous speech. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Greed is right. Greed works. Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. It is a sentence, an idea that is so imprinted in our brain. I guess I want to ask you about today. Your book is a long history book, but as far as our political discourse today, how is this power of the free market or the big myth, as your book calls market fundamentalism, how does it play out today? Well, it continues to play out, and we see in conservative and Republican opposition to meaningful action on climate change, to meaningful regulation of drugs, that we have now have you know, the opioid crisis, which, by the way, there is no opioid crisis in Europe because these drugs were more adequately regulated, massive income inequality, tax cuts for the rich, all based on this idea that if you just let business people, rich people 
do their thing, that somehow we will all benefit, even though the evidence consistently shows that that is in fact not true. You know, the movie obviously is a critique of this ideology and not too many people today would stand up in public and say greed is good. Mm. But people do continue to say that self-interest is good, that self-interest drives entrepreneurs, it drives people to invent things and be creative. And that's true up to a point, but we also know that self-interest has to be tempered against the common good and that when we have inadequate regulation of markets and workplaces, people get hurt. And of course, this connects us to one other really important part of our story, which is the misrepresentation of Adam Smith. So the same business people who are talking to Rose Wilder Lane and creating propagandistic television and radio Mm -hmm. are also working to influence academic research. And so we have a chapter in the book where we talk about the University of Chicago and how business interests fund something at the University of Chicago called the Free Market Project. Yeah. The economist George Stigler, who's part of this Free Market Project, publishes an edited version of The Wealth of Nations in which he takes out of the original book all the many places where Adam Smith talked about the need for regulation. So Smith, for example, has a very extensive discussion of why you have to regulate banks. But in Stigler's version, which is then... He cherry picks. He cherry picks, and there is no discussion of the need to regulate banks. Yeah. Finally, uh, Naomi Oreskes, I want to ask, your book goes into market fundamentalism and the the forces and the money that have contributed to this idea over time. I wonder if you see a fundamentalism in another way, as in cynicism about the market. That is, there are people who, if you have a conversation and you say the word industry, there is a visceral negative reaction. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think that we have witnessed in the last 40 years so many egregious abuses and so many problems that we thought we had solved that in many ways we had solved have now come back because of deregulation or inadequate enforcement of existing regulations. So I think this has made some people angry And it's brought back a kind of hostility and anger towards business and industry that existed back in the 1930s. And it's also made some people want to say a pox on capitalism. So part of our argument is to argue for a kind of sensible common ground. We're not saying that business is bad. We need business and industry as part of having an economy. Uh, And we need markets because markets are quite good for many things, but they also need to be properly regulated. Naomi Oreskes is co-author of The Big Myth, How American Business Taught Us to Loathe Government and Love the Free Market. Naomi, thanks for the time. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on the show. Do you ever feel like your laptop just keeps going, but you are completely drained? I think a lot of us don't realize how much pain we live in because of our interactions with computing. NPR's Body Electric, a special interactive series investigating how to fix the relationship between our tech and our health. Listen in the TED Radio Hour feed wherever you get your podcasts. This message comes from NPR sponsor, City. They're not an airline, but their network connects global businesses in nearly 160 local markets. With over two centuries of experience, they're not just any bank. They are city. More at city.com slash we are city.